We understand a refrigeration cycle, let's apply another scenario. And this scenario is gonna be a refrigerant restriction. So let's go through some of these possibilities. So first thing we're gonna say a refrigerant restriction means it's not flowing from the condenser to the evaporator like it should. So there's multiple things that can cause a refrigerant restriction, such as the metering device being too small. They left the metering device for the evaporator instead of having it match the compressor, and that was an issue. Or maybe the TXV is stuck closed and it's not letting enough refrigerant flow through, or maybe there's a kink somewhere in this liquid line or a valve is closed or the filter dryer is clogged up. So we'll start with the easiest one, the filter dryer is clogged up. So what we'll do is we'll check for a delta T of our filter dryer. The temperature of the refrigerant coming in versus the refrigerant of the temperature coming out. And those two numbers should be very, very close together. There should be very little, if any, temperature drop across that. As you start seeing a temperature drop, now you know that that is where your restriction is going to be. But also you can have restriction at your metering device. Checking the temperature drop across your metering device doesn't do anything because there isn't any kind of set numbers to go by. There's an argument over that, but remember that your suction temperature and your suction pressure is determined by airflow and the amount of refrigerant coming in. So there's lots of factors on that. So you can't just simply measure the temperature drop there. But what about a liquid line service valve? If you had a restriction there, maybe somebody didn't open it all the way. We can take the cap off, we can look inside and see if it's fully open. We can also check temperature drops across multiple locations. I found a restriction in a liquid line through a wall by checking the temperature of the refrigerant going into the wall versus the temperature of the refrigerant coming out of the wall. And I found out we had a big temperature difference across that point. A temperature difference through that liquid line meant also there was a pressure drop to that liquid line. And we had to cut the wall open and sure enough we found out to where the carpenter had done some work and had actually kinked that line. So all of these are possibilities. First one I want to eliminate is that filter dryer. It's the easiest one. Remember that filter dryer can be located anywhere in the liquid line, ideally before our metering device, but a lot of manufacturers now are putting them inside of the outdoor unit. It's still the liquid line, but what they'll do is they'll install it there. And the reason that's a problem is because I've seen many times somebody works on the system and they put a new filter dryer over here, but they never replace the existing filter dryer inside of the outdoor unit. This is the filter dryer that's gonna get clogged up and stopped up, and that's gonna cause a restriction. And because it's behind the service valve, you never see it. So look inside of the outdoor unit and see if there's a filter dryer in there. Remember if we had the other video, some of them look like little hot dogs, copper hot dogs, or they may look like a filter dryer or tons of different designs, but if it's on that liquid line, if it's something that looks unfamiliar and there's no wires on it, it's most likely gonna be a liquid line filter dryer. So take a look at that, be thinking of that. Let's see what's gonna to happen to our refrigeration cycle though when we have a restriction. So if we have a restriction, let's think of the flow of a refrigerant. We wanted this much subcooled liquid, but because we have a restriction, we end up with too much subcooled liquid in our condensing unit. Because we have too much subcooled liquid, our subcooling goes up, and we end up with what we call a flooded condensing cool, because all the refrigerant's backing up inside of our condensing unit. Now, because we have too much subcooled liquid, I have a much smaller amount of space for my saturation. So my saturation has to transfer all that heat and change state from a vapor down to a liquid in a much smaller area. The only way we can make that happen is by having also higher pressure. So our pressure is gonna go up and also our saturated temperature goes up to get that heat to transfer in a smaller area. Now because our saturated temperature goes up, that means the temperature difference between the refrigerant and the air is gonna be much farther apart. So our condenser TD, also called saturated temperature rise, also called condensing temperature over ambient or CTOA, will also be farther apart. In other words, a bigger difference between the refrigerant condensing temperature and the air temperature. That's also what you call a high head pressure. So those are gonna be some numbers that you're gonna see going up. Now on this side, because we're restricting that refrigerant, it's not getting to the evaporator coil, we have the opposite effect. So because we don't have enough liquid refrigerant here, we end up with less saturation over here. So less saturation is gonna be a few things. Less saturation means my refrigerant's gonna boil away very fast. So I wanted this much superheated vapor, but now I have this much superheated vapor. So my superheat goes up. Too much superheated vapor means not enough liquid saturation mixture. So we'd have a starved evaporator coil, not enough liquid refrigerant inside of our evaporator coil. And also because we have less refrigerant in our evaporator coil, we end up with a lower suction pressure, which also relates to a lower saturated temperature. And if our saturated temperature drops below 30 degrees, 32, we end up with our evaporator coil starting to 
freeze. It's going to be freezing from that meeting device moving forward. So these are all issues that we're going to be looking for. Now also because my saturated temperature has dropped even lower, it's going to be much farther apart from the return air temperature. The house temperature is not going to change quickly, but there's going to be a bigger temperature difference. So the TD temperature difference is going to be much farther apart. The saturated refrigerant boiling temperature is going to be much lower than the air temperature. And because I'm boiling refrigerant in a much smaller area, instead of the whole entire evaporator coil, I'm only boiling this much liquid refrigerant, that means overall I'm absorbing less heat from the air. So the temperature of the air coming in and the temperature of the air coming out is now going to be closer together. So my delta T will end up dropping, end up with lower delta T. So if we take a look at this whole scenario, end up with a lower suction pressure and a higher condensing pressure, we end up with a compression ratio that starts to now go up. We have a big higher compression ratio. Remember that compression now having to go down lower to absorb this lower pressure and less dense vapor and now having to push really hard to stack that pressure in a higher amount. So that compression is doing a whole lot more work making that happen. So if we have a restriction, these are some of the scenarios that you're going to see on this. It's going to have a big play in it. So all these scenarios are going to cause the same thing. Now with the TXV, if somebody overheated it while brazing, that could cause damage to the TXV. Or if they didn't braze with nitrogen like they're supposed to, all that nitrogen with the new PLE oil clogs up the screen before the metering device or it can actually clog up the metering device itself. And that's what the fixed orifice or a TXV when they were brazing that suction line, you damage that sensing bulb. All these scenarios can cause that TXV not to open properly and ends up being a restriction as well as too small of a metering device. See how all of this ties together? A clogged up filter dryer, a valve not opened all the way, all of these things can cause that. So if you think about all these different aspects, causing a refrigerant restriction can be important, but also non-condensables can cause these same symptoms. Let's look at non-condensables on a refrigeration cycle. If we're looking at superheat and subcooling, it's gonna give us the same effects as we would with the restriction. In other words, if we have non-condensables, it's gonna look like our condensing unit is flooded and it's gonna look like our evaporator coil is starved. But in reality, there's a little bit more going on. What it means is non-condensables, impurities in the refrigerant. We're gonna end up with non-condensables collecting at the top of the condensing coil. So instead of de-superheating right here, all of this is where most of our non-condensables collect at. If I had a recovery tank and I had refrigerant in it, a pure refrigerant, one molecule only, and I had non-condensables in that refrigerant, we could by theory open up the vapor side and the non-condensables, because they would collect at the top of the tank, would draft out of that tank first. Now it's not legal to do that because we'd be losing refrigerant. And with blended refrigerants, with multiple different types of refrigerant, we cannot do that because it'll fractionate, which we'll talk about that later. But non-condensables are gonna collect at the top of the condensing unit. Or if I had it in a tank, it collected at the top of a tank. When you take your EPA test and talk about class three, where is your purge unit located? Purge unit's gonna be getting rid of non-condensables. It's always located at the top of the condensing unit. So it's wanting to get rid of or purge out these contaminants. That's what they're gonna be. Now the catch with that is it's gonna throw off your temperature pressure chart. Because you have these non-condensables in there, you really don't know where your refrigerant's condensing at. So it gives you the symptoms of having a high amount of subcooled liquid and a low amount of superheated vapor. But what it's really doing is throwing off your temperature pressure chart. So we really don't know where saturation's happening here and we really don't know where saturation's happening here. But when you do have non-condensables, you do see that your head pressure goes up, which means your liquid saturated temperature also goes up. And because your saturated temperature goes up a lot more, you end up with a higher condenser TD. The temperature difference between your temperature pressure chart and the air is much, much farther apart. We also end up with a less of a delta T because overall we're moving less amount of heat across our condensing coil. On the inside, it still also typically throws off our temperature pressure chart. We don't really know what's happening. So because our non-condensables are collecting over here, we don't really know where saturated is, but we also know that we're not having the right amount of refrigerant here, which typically ends up giving us a higher amount of a suction pressure, which also immediately is connected to our suction saturated. So our saturated temperature is gonna be higher. Overall, because we have the non-condensables over here, it affects how much refrigerant's coming into our evaporator coil. So typically, we end up with a lower delta T and also kind of a variance between the TD. It's kind of up and down on what's gonna happen. But all of that non-condensables throws off. It throws the whole system into a mess because we really don't know where saturation is taking place. Now, if the symptoms are very similar between a restriction and a non-condensable, how can you check? In other words, the delta T for the filter dryer or the delta T on different spots of the liquid line. So those are ideas. However, if you're having a restriction on your metering device, a lot of times you just have to open that metering device up. 
So here's the catch. If we have to open that metering device up anyways, that means we have to take the refrigerant out of the system anyways. So instead of doing a pump down, what I'll do is I'll take all the refrigerant out of the system and I'll put it into a recovery tank by itself, its own recovery tank. And now to take all the refrigerant and put it into that tank, there's liquid and there's vapor together in that recovery tank. So if I let it sit and let it equalize, I can get the temperature of the tank with a thermometer on the bottom side of the tank where it's liquid. I can also hook my pressure gauge up to it. Now I know the pressure of the tank and I know the temperature of the tank. And I supposedly know what refrigerant's in that tank. So then you pull out your app, get your temperature pressure chart from your app and compare your pressure and the temperature that your app is showing on your temperature pressure chart. And that should match the temperature and pressure of the refrigerant in the tank. If they match, you don't have non-condensables. If they don't match, then you know for sure you have non-condensables. That means you have contaminants in there. There's not a pure mixture in there. Maybe somebody put some of the refrigerant in or there's moisture, they didn't pull a good vacuum, a whole scenario of things, but it's telling you what's happening. Now, I'm still gonna open up this meeting device. I'm gonna check that little hidden screen inside of there. I'm gonna check the meeting device to make sure there's no oxidation inside of there. I'm gonna make sure it's not clogged up. I wanna make sure it's not been overheated. I'm gonna check all these components out. I wanna know if there's any other issues going on. And then I'm gonna put that back together. Now that I've eliminated that from being an issue, I'm going to then put in a brand new filter dryer. So even though my filter dryer didn't have a Delta T across it, we open the system, we're still gonna change that filter dryer. So now that all the refrigerant's out of the system, I'm also going to open up my metering device. And if it's a fixed orifice, I'm gonna check it. I'm gonna look for discoloration. Has it turned black? Is there any issues with a burnout in there? Is there any issues with oxidation stopping that up? And there's also typically a little screen right here before the metering device. I wanna check that screen, see if it's clean. If it's a TXV, I wanna look inside that TXV and see if it's any kind of dirt or contaminants inside of there. All these things I wanna do. At the same time, I'm gonna hook nitrogen up to my liquid port outside and flow nitrogen through inside. And I wanna see if I'm getting any contaminants, any gunk coming out of that. At the same time, I wanna see if there's a pressure drop. If I'm putting nitrogen on this side and I'm not getting any nitrogen coming out the other side, that tells me there's a restriction somewhere in this liquid line. So it's very easy to diagnose that once I have all the refrigerant out. Now when I'm done with that, I'm gonna put all these connections back together. I'm gonna to put in a brand new filter dryer and I'm gonna pressure test to make sure there's no leaks. Then I'm going to pull a vacuum down below 500 microns and then it's ready to put refrigerant in. Now here's the catch. A lot of people will want to put that existing refrigerant back in the system if it checked out okay. I do not want to do that. I always want to use new refrigerant, fresh refrigerant, virgin refrigerant going into the system. Here's the thing. You don't know truly the condition. Even if it matches the temperature and pressure chart, what other contaminants are in that refrigerant? The labor it took me to take all that refrigerant out and do all this work and pressure test and put it back in is a significant cost and a significant amount of money to the customer. The cost of the refrigerant is very little overall. Refrigerant's expensive, but it's this much expense compared to all the labor that went into that. So I'm gonna put new refrigerant back into the system so I know there's not even a possibility of non-condensables. Now legally, if you take the refrigerant out and put it in its own tank with no other customer's refrigerant in that tank, it can only be the refrigerant from that same customer. And then I can legally filter that refrigerant and put it back into that system. By law, you can, but it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Now I need to make a note, when you're working with commercial systems and you're dealing with hundreds of pounds of refrigerant, then yes, you're gonna take that refrigerant out, you're gonna filter it, you're gonna clean it, and then you're gonna filter it and clean it when you put it back in, which we call recycling it. You're gonna make sure you dry that refrigerant out. But you're talking about hundreds of pounds of a very expensive refrigerant, that changes things. And refrigeration has a different level of rules. We're talking about between three to 10 pounds of refrigerant for residential. The cost of that refrigerant is nothing compared to the labor and amount of time that goes into it. So now I've taken that system apart, I've checked it, I've assured that there's no restriction, and I also put brand new refrigerant in. So now that system's up and running, I know that there's not a restriction. I know we don't have a non-condensables issue. If I put it all back in, I'm still getting the signs of a restriction and then most likely it's gonna be a TXV. In that case, I'll simply pump the system down, store the refrigerant in the condensing unit, change that TXV, and go through the little processes really quick. But that gives you an idea of what's happening. How to check between a refrigerant restriction and non-condensables. The ultimately, the repair between the two is very similar. Just put back new refrigerant unless it's a commercial system and you're gonna save yourself a whole lot of headaches in the future.